I'm going to do something that I've never done, actually, uh, for the first time in my life. Um, I'm going to do a TED Talk, obviously. Never done that before. Um, but the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about my day. So I woke up today with a plan. A plan. I knew exactly what I was going to do. It's not what you think. Because at 11 o'clock this morning, um, I was very proud to marry the lovely Mrs. Charlotte Faker, <laughs> who is now Mrs. McCanch. So now that that's taken the heat off me, maybe I should start. So who am I? Right. So my name is Jamie. Um, I'm a, a writer. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm an adaptive athlete. Um, I'm a speaker. Um, but I'm a survivor. And that's the key. That's why I'm here today. But I'm also really good at failing. And that is also the main reason why I'm here today. So, I mean, I, I haven't got a story that's quite like Rian's. Um, but my story is a story of ups and downs. So I'm going to start off with getting you guys to just take a moment. I just want you to think about your life. So what did you do this morning? You got up. You went to the bathroom. You'd done your ablutions. You went down the stairs. You had some breakfast. Then you thought, oh, I've got to clean my teeth. So back up the stairs you go. You clean your teeth. Then maybe some of you went to work. So back down the stairs you go, out the front door. Have you got a step out your front door? Maybe two, maybe three? You get in your car. Manual, right? Yeah, most people drive a manual car. I don't, but most people do. You get in your car and you go to work. Let's think about your workplace. So you get to your workplace and you go through the doors and, oh, your desk. It's upstairs, right? Back up the stairs you go. Yes, your desk. About average height? Yeah. So what do you think about when you leave work? So you come out of work, you get back in that pesky manual car of yours, and you start to drive home. And most of you are thinking about what you're having for dinner or what you're going to do that evening. And some of you, guess what? We can actually play sport now. Some of you are thinking, oh, I've got to go and play football, right? Or netball or hockey. Yeah? Yeah? And then you go back to bed, right? Think about that. That's your life, right? Am I right? That's how quick it can change. I went to bed on the 6th of January 2014, living the perfect life. When I woke up on January the 7th, 2014, I woke up paralyzed from the waist down. My life was turned upside down. My home, that's right, I had stairs, became a prison. My car, that's right, it was a manual, pointless. My job, I was earning 45,000 pound a year as a motorcycle salesman. Let me tell you, no one wants to buy a motorbike from the dude in a wheelchair. <laughs> Just doesn't happen, right? <laughs> Pretty bad for business. Now look, Life had its ups and downs, right? All of a sudden, I'm in this world that I don't know. Home, my home was a prison. The people, I couldn't go and see my friends and my family. Oh, you're all sitting there, right? You're all going, oh yeah, I remember that. They called it 2020. No, I called it my life from 2014. So I was well prepared for this 2020 malarkey. <laughs> but then, life really started to hit home for me. I felt like I was a burden on my friends, on my family, on society. I mean, let's be honest, I was just this cripple. I used to be in the army. I've been shot. I've been blown up. For a small period of time, I was even a prisoner of war. And here I am. I can't even leave the house without someone with me just in case I do something stupid like fall over. And I remember it was um, just an average day, and we were going to a wedding. And I was dressed, not, not my wedding. That happened today. So I was going to a wedding, and I was all dressed up in my clobber. And I looked down, and I'd wet myself couldn't get past that. Every day, that's all I thought about. I'm just useless. I'm a waste of space. That led to a drug overdose, my first major failing. That's right, guys, I failed. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. But I remember lying in the hospital bed, and a friend came in to see me. And funny enough, he was not far from here, and he spoke in this really broad Welsh accent. And he said, you're right, Bat. We've been up to when? Apologies, everyone. Um, <laughs> don't lynch me, right? You don't hit disabled people. It's very uncouth. So. <laughs> So he came in, and, and he basically asked me, what have you been up to? And, and I'd done something I'd never done before. I told him. I spoke about my anger. I spoke about my frustration. I spoke about being stuck in this godforsaken body that was weak, unforgiving, useless. Two hours, I cried. Lots of snot. It wasn't a pretty sight. Just let you leave you with that image. And at the end, he never said anything. He just said, why don't you try basketball? I was like, dude, I've just cried for you for two hours. What's basketball going to do for me? <laughs> what have you got to lose? But you know what he did that day? He did something that no one else had done. 
He didn't talk. He listened. Oh, my life was saved because someone listened. So if you've got nothing to say, and I've got plenty to say, but if you've got nothing to say, be the one that listens. Because to the world, you may just be one person. To the world, you may just be a grain of, grain of sand. But to someone, you are the world. To someone, you will save their life just by doing nothing. Think about that for a second. So what do I do? I went and played basketball. That's right. Three months later, I was playing basketball for Cardiff. Seven months later, I was playing rugby for Wales. I don't really know how that happened. Someone came up to me, and they said, you're really fast in that chair, aren't you? I said, yeah, stop in that I have difficulties with. They said, that's OK. We're going to play rugby. I said, brilliant. Sign me up. So anyway, I started playing rugby. I got capped six times for my country, seven months after being come. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. Please keep it coming. This is all about me. So. But I had a dream. I wanted to climb mountains. Mountain was my thing. I loved mountains. So I did. I took a wheelchair designed for Tesco's. I cut the front end off. I took a push bike designed for a child, cut the front end, welded two together. You know where this is going. And I climbed up a mountain. I became the second person ever to self-propel up Penny Van Mountain. Now, I forget one fundamental trick when I decide to build this wheelchair. Because what goes up must come down. And guess what I didn't put on my chair? <laughs> Brakes. Now. <laughs> It gets better. There's 111 drainage trenches on the way up to Penny Van. I counted every single one of them as I face planted on the way back down. <laughs> so I learned a valuable lesson that day. Always put brakes on your wheelchair. Now, I promised you ups and downs, right? Listen, 2015, I raised 250,000 pounds for charity on my own. What did I do? <laughs> thank you, thank you. I've only got 10 minutes, keep it short. What did I do? I jumped out of an airplane at 15,000 feet. I climbed a mountain on my bare hands. I, I went to a Christmas market. Trust me, the biggest challenge I've ever done. I got stabbed in the face with an umbrella, and I even got smacked around the head with a basket. Don't ask me how that happened, but it happened. I'd done 12 extreme challenges in 12 months. I even went downhill in a wheelchair at 45 miles an hour through a forest. How I've still got my head, I don't know. I did have a GoPro on the top of my helmet, and that disappeared, so I don't know what happened to that. But we'll move on, right? 2016, I then got nominated and I won the prestigious Charles Holland Award, which is actually a spin-off of the Pride of Britain Award. And I was very proud of this. I was very, very proud of this moment. And I was on the radio, I was on the telly, I was living the dream, right? 2017 came. Guess what? Things change. Things happen. It happens for a reason. My wife sat me down. Not this one, it was my other wife. She <laughs> sat me down. <laughs> Thought I'd just get that out there. She sat me down and she'd done something that I'd never seen before in my life. I've seen someone be completely, 100%, categorically, if that's a word, honest with themselves. She said, Jamie, I don't love you anymore. I'm not in love with you. I want a divorce. I said, you're taking this New Year's resolution thing a bit far. It was January the 1st. Six weeks later, I didn't have any time to think about a divorce. Six weeks later, I entered another battle. I got diagnosed with cancer. This time, I had to go through chemo. Chemo sucks, by the way. Probably the worst diet you'll ever go through. I lost three stone in about three months. Um, not recommended, but I did lose the weight, and I did look fabulous. But that's not what I'm here for. <laughs> so I, being, you know, a man, grr, yes, I moved in with my mum. <laughs> Best thing I ever did. My mum came over one day, and my mum is very motivational, and she said, Jamie, sorry, kids, please block your ears. She said, Jamie, you look like shit. I said, thanks, mum, I'm kind of going through a little bit of a moment of my life. <laughs> and she said, she said, I think you should move in with me. I said, mum, I'm 33 years old. I'll move in on Thursday. <laughs> so, now, two weeks later, I'm living with my mum, and I do love my mum. She's a dear soul. And if anyone has ever met her, John the photographer, he absolutely met my mum today, daughter. Two weeks after I moved in, I found my mum flat on the living room floor. I was like, mum, mum, you're right. Flat out. I thought she had a heart attack. So I called the doctors. My mum's 66th birthday. Guess what she had for that year for her birthday? Yes, that's right. She was diagnosed with a three and a half inch brain tumor. A whole different world started up again. So now I'm going through chemo. My mum's going through chemo. We had a bond, right? Every time I was having chemo, she wouldn't, which meant I was safe to look after her. When I was having chemo, she wouldn't, which meant she was there to look after me. The bond between a mother and a son that no one else had probably experiences, but let me tell you, it will stay with me for the rest of my life. My brother inconsiderate sod, was helping me out. Then he decided to have three heart attacks. So he was out of the picture. Well, I went into remission in January 2018, and I was very, very happy about that. And my mum had her operation in the February. And you know what? Life was all right. But now I was doing this whole different thing. I was teaching my mum how to read, how to write, how to wash her face. I won't tell you all the stories. Some of them are hilarious. Um, 
but we did it, and we did it together as a team, that level of resilience, because that's what I learned in my journey, right? And it's not a story, it's a journey. I learned about resilience. I learned about things just go pear-shaped sometimes, but, and you fall over. It's a fact of life. Every single one of you in this room, sorry to be the burn of bad news, you're all going to fail, every one of you. But that is the route to success, failure. You need a goal. I've done so much with my life. And I'm very proud of the things that I've done and the things that I've achieved. And I'm proud of the people that have been around me to help me to achieve those things. But you need a goal. You need a dream. Because without a dream, without a goal, you've got nothing. It's your why. It's the reason why we all get up in the morning is because our goals and our dreams, and some of them are achieved and some of them aren't. And that's okay. And I remember talking about dreams. I went to start playing squash. That's right. I became the first person in the world to play squash in a wheelchair. Everyone thought I was crazy. Then they met me, and they knew that I was. <laughs> so I started playing squash. I thought, this wasn't enough for me. So then, through physio, I went to my physio, and my physio said, you need a goal. I said, I've got a goal. I'm the man of goals. She says, brilliant. What's your goal? I said, Everest. She looked at me with this rather strange look, and she just went, let's get you standing first, maybe walking across the room. I went, brilliant. Then we'll do Everest. <laughs> Six months later, I walked Penny Van on crutches under my own steam. She would say to me, how many hours of physio do you do this week, Jamie? I said, 16. She said, Jamie, I, did, I told you to do a couple. I said, 16 is a couple. Um, I would watch telly. I don't like telly, but I'd watch it. And I'd only watch Channel 3, ITV, because you can't do this physio with BBC because there's no adverts. So what I would do is I'd watch a television program, and when the adverts come on, I'd stand up. And when the adverts went off, I'd sit back down. And that was physio for me. I even did that through Emmerdale. Never been so depressed in my life. So, like I said, you've got to set yourself a goal, but you've got to give everything, right? Don't worry about plan A, plan B, plan C. Everyone's got plan A, plan B, plan C. What the hell is that? Concentrate on plan A. You won't need plan B, plan C, or plan D. And if all goes pear-shaped, you've always got plan F. So don't worry about the rest. Concentrate on plan A, because every single one of you has the ability and the possibility to achieve your goals. So let's talk a little bit about Everest. Now, that's been my goal since I was seven years old. And it was annihilated in January the, 14th, January the 7th, 2014. I thought, why did I just climb Everest earlier? Now I had a new goal. I'm going to climb Everest. OK, it's the same goal, but it's a new challenge. So we set the date, May 2020. Yeah. <laughs> Some dude ate a bat, and look where we all are. <laughs> Say it as is, right? But 2020 was a hard year, because in January 2020, my nephew, who had been diagnosed with cancer, unfortunately, my sister went in to see him at 7 o'clock uh, on the 13th of January, and my nephew had passed away. So January was a very, very difficult time for us. And then I was still living on this, I'm going to Everest, things are going to be fine. We had the funeral. Then we went into lockdown. I was like, shit, what's going on here? Then, but it's okay. This is only going to happen. Three weeks, I said. Three weeks. Yeah, like I said, I'm very good at failing. I'm also very good at being wrong. So Everest never happened. So we decided to do it this year. <laughs> yeah, um, about that, it never happened. Um, because Nepal went into the red zone. So now my dream has been smashed twice, but it's never, ever been lost. And in 2022, myself, my new wife, and a team of fantastic people will be climbing Everest. And I will be doing it on my crutches. I will conquer my mountain. And so will every single one of you, as long as you concentrate on plan A and don't give a shit about B, C, D, or E. And if you fall, do one thing, always get back up. Thank you very much. <laughs>